Hello, everyone who's joining our uh, current topics in renal and adrenal imaging work taster webinar. Um, my name is Professor Sardev. I'm a radiology consultant in the UK, London. One of my specialties is endocrine imaging and adrenal imaging, and I do urology and gynae in the rest of my time. So I'd just very quickly like to thank our corporate sponsors, Siemens Healthcare and Gerbe, um, for sponsoring our webinar today, and also our uh, workshop later in the year. I'd also like to just bring to your attention a couple of upcoming masterclasses in imaging. There's pancreatic tumours um, in March 2023, and there's also response assessment at the end of March this year. And then finally, I'd also like to emphasise our masterclass in the current topics of renal and adrenal imaging. This will be a on-site uh, workshop in London uh, and it will be case-based with emphasis on um, current imaging guidelines and uh, modern imaging of the uh, disease entities. Finally, there is the um, annual general meeting for the International Council of Imaging Society. Again, this is held in London this year and it is within uh, the British Museum. So everybody's welcome. Uh, please join. These are great sessions and uh, have fantastic speakers with very good topic selection. So moving straight on to the webinar itself, I'm going to talk today, um, give you a succinct understanding of imaging for functional adrenal disease. Um, and for this particular session, uh, it's a real shoot through through uh, adrenal disease, which is actually quite a wide topic. So starting straight away, functional disorders of the adrenal gland, you can consider them either as hyperfunction or hypofunction. And the hyperfunction may be arising either from cortical disease or from a medullary disease within the adrenal glands. For these conditions, usually the clinical scenario is that the patient is already presenting with symptoms of the adrenal hyperfunction or there is biochemical upset um, and the disease entity is already suspected. In this situation, the role of imaging is really to locate the lesions where we, uh, which we think are causing the disease, to characterize them if there is more than one possibility of what could be causing the disease, and then finally to assist in treatment planning. And usually the, uh, the treatment is surgical if the disease entity is limited. Now, one of the good things about um, adrenal functional disease is it presents reasonably early and therefore the vast majority of the patients will be surgically managed. Rarely, but it does happen as we image more people now, the adrenal dysfunction may be found as part of the incidental pathway. So we find the lesion first and then realize that it also has functional uh, capability. And then again, these lesions will be treated by, with a surgical approach. The hyperfunction of the adrenal really can be understood by dividing the adrenal gland into two succinct um, areas. And in fact, most people will, will understand the adrenal gland by considering it almost as two different glands that have come together. The outer adrenal gland, which is the cortex, is the true endocrine uh, organ, whereas the inner um, uh, adrenal gland is really a neuroendocrine nest. So the disease entities that arise from these two disease uh, sections reflect the fact that they, they arise from completely different embryological backgrounds. So the adrenal cortex will have diseases mainly associated with epithelial diseases in the rest of the body. So the endocrine organ will generally have adenomas, carcinomas, or collision tumors, whereas the neuroendocrine components uh, within the central part of the gland will have mainly neuroendocrine diseases. So the most outermost gland, it produces aldosterone and you'll get aldosterone disorders. So hypertension is usually the presentation and it's usually adenomas that cause this disease. The second layer in is a cortisol producing layer. And again, these patients either present with hypertension or with uh, adrenal Cushing's. 
and the innermost cortex layer is a androgen producing layer and these patients will present with virilization and in women with menstrual disturbance. The medulla, as I said, is neuroendocrine um, with, and they will present with a wide range of, of symptoms of neuroendocrine tumours, but again hypertension um, and the flight-flight response and palpitations are the most common presentation. So what do we need to know about Conn syndrome uh, or, or hyperaldosteronism? So 80%, the textbooks will tell you that about 80% is due to bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, where you've got more than one functioning cortical adenoma, which is producing the, hyper the aldosterone. And about 20% is due to an autonomous aldosterone producing adenoma. Actually, these proportions are beginning to change in the literature, and that's because we are now beginning to detect smaller adenomas, which we didn't see before, um, and also due to carbon-11 metomidate, which is, again, a localizing uh, tracer that helps us identify the small adenomas that we didn't see before. So the role of imaging in uh, Conn's disease is really to distinguish between the bilateral disease or a unilateral single adenoma. And the reason for that is that if the patient has a BAH or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, this will be in large portions medically managed. And the surgery, if it's ever performed, is off the dominant side when the medical um, management is failing. So it's really a holding uh, or a final situation where all medical uh, management has failed. Whereas an APA is exactly the opposite. So for an APA, the first um, treatment strategy is surgical. So you want to localize it and you want to treat it surgically. And the vast majority of these patients are then um, cured of their hypertension. APAs are difficult because characteristically, these are very small lesions. Um, I've said 1.5 to 2 centimeters. Actually, they're even smaller than that and very quite difficult to find when they're sub-centimeter. They have all the characteristic features of a benign adenoma. Um, I'm not really going to dwell on that. You know mainly what that is. So non-contrast CT attenuation is less than 10 Hounsfield units. They have characteristic washouts of 60 and 40, absolute and relative uh, washouts. And on MR, they will have uh, loss of signal intensity on the outer phase images. So once these are localized, um, all the features of a benign adenoma. The imaging challenge is really to find these little guys um, and the sensitivity and sensitivity uh, specificity of MR um, is really between about 88% for detecting the small APAs. So about 20% of these we won't see um, and we then have to think of what else we can do to find the adenomas. In bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, again, you may be lucky and you may actually see both adrenal glands are equally abnormal, and so you're quite confident that you have a bilateral disease. However, you can get just unilateral adrenal enlargement, but it does mean that it involves the whole of the adrenal gland being enlarged, so all the limbs, the body, all of them are enlarged, and that Enlargement can either be very smooth, as in this case, where the entire the gland is just um, enlarged in size without there being a focal measurable lesion. Whereas you can also get nodular bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, where you can see multiple adenomas in both glands. Now, the challenge here is is this genuine bilateral adrenal hyperplasia so that you've got more than one functioning adenoma and therefore you've got functional disease bilaterally which you can only then manage really uh, medically to begin with or is it that you've got one functioning adrenal adenoma which is autonomous and the others are non-functioning and simply hiding the one that is functioning so Again, now the issue with bilateral adrenal hyperplasia is, can we confirm that all of these adenomas are functioning or is there just a single lesion that is actually active? So if you've got completely normal glands or you've got bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, actually the specificity remains quite well. There is only the odd occasion where you will have a single functioning adenoma and the others are quiescent. Um, 
So this difficulty of determining whether you have a single functioning adenoma or multiple functioning adenomas versus one that is actually not being visualized is traditionally very difficult. And what we used to do was um, adrenal venous catheterization. And this difficult, AVS is not an easy procedure. And you can see that the IR consultants actually have to enter this tiny little adrenal vein to catheterize the adrenal gland um, and then uh, obtain venous samples from this particular part of the venous anatomy, the renal vein and the IVC to be, to be sure that they've got a functioning lesion on one side versus the other. So at the moment, we only ever do this now when we cannot find an adenoma, but you have biochemically confirmed hyperaldosteronism. When you've got bilateral nodules and you're not sure which side you want to operate on, or there's disagreement between CT and MR. So it's, and, and there it's being used as a problem solver. It's now, it's considered as the gold standard between distinguishing between APAs and BAH. But increasingly, we are beginning to use the carbon-11 metomidate tracer uh, where it's available because this localizes the APAs as well. Um, there are quite a few problems with metomidate and in the workshop, we will actually um, uh, concentrate on, on the use of metomidate a little bit more. So moving on to Cushing's disease. Um, the adrenal causes of Cushing's disease will always be in the context of ACTH independent disease. So if you've got ACTH dependence, which means that the ACTH levels are high, then the causes are not going to be adrenal. In that situation, you're really dealing with pituitary disease or an ectopic ACTH producer. And in adrenal uh, disease, the ACTH will be reduced because there is uh, autonomous production of cortisol from the adrenal gland. And again, this can happen in two ways. You can either have a unilateral lesion, um, and these are usually adenomas or carcinomas, or you can have bilateral pathology. And bilateral pathology is usually congenital hyperplasias. In adults, you'll find them in massive adrenal hyperplasia, and in children, it will be pigmented uh, uh, multinodular hyperplasia, which is part of the Carney's complex. The vast majority is unilateral, and it makes up for about 80% or 80 to 85% of all the disease that we see in ACTH independent Cushing's. The role of imaging, again, is to localize and characterize the unilateral disease. And in this case, we need to be able to tell the difference between an adenoma and a carcinoma, because that will determine the type of surgery that the patient will undergo. So again, uh, adrenal adenomas this time are actually larger um, and they're not so difficult to find. They're usually between two to four centimeters in size by the time they're detected. And they again have all the features of a normal benign adenoma. So you're looking really for all the CT characteristics and you're looking for the MR characteristics. We generally tend to use um, MR much more than we'd use a CT when we know that the patient has Cushing's already. And the chemical shift loss is, is uh, very com comforting when we, when we see it in such a nice homogenous lesion. It used to be said that ad uh, adrenal carcinomas are usually very large at presentation. Um, they're obviously malignant lesions that are invading the vessels, invading the surrounding structures. However, that pattern again, with the increasing use of imaging and increasingly using it earlier and earlier in the disease, that pattern is also changing. So we tend to pick up the ACCs in a much earlier uh, pathway. We've just got to remember that AC, uh, ACCs occur in two main peaks. They are much more frequent in children in Cushing's disease than they are in adults. So in fact, in majority of the children, if they're present with Cushing's, will have an ACC rather than an adenoma, whereas adults will more likely have an adenoma. Then this pattern flips over once you go past the fifth decade. And again, ACCs become more common. So. The distinction on imaging is adenoma or ACC. And it's not that easy because as the adenomas get larger, they start to become heterogeneous and start to mimic the ACCs. And similarly, if you pick up ACCs early, they can also look like adenomas. So 
we need to be sure when we're actually working out between the ACCs and adenomas. And the reason for that is most adenomas will be taken out laparoscopically with um, minimal uh, intervention, whereas ACCs need block resection and they might need wider resection of lymph nodes um, and surrounding structures. So the clinical manifestations in patients who present with adrenal hyperplasias is mild. And funnily enough, the vast majority of adrenal hyperplastic associated Cushing's is incidental. So in the last few cases, at least that we've had, we've picked up the adrenal abnormalities first, and then we've gone back and looked at their biochemistry, which shows that they have mild adrenal Cushing's. In children, uh, it's it's in, as I said, in context of the Carney's complex, usually. They're usually women, uh, young girls, um, they're young, less than 10 years old, and the adrenal glands, again, just look a little bit nodular and a little bit hyperplastic. So this is the most recent case that I've got where you can see that the adrenal contour has just become a little bit nodular. Again, it would be very difficult to, uh, to measure out one particular nodule, but you can appreciate that if you were to describe this adrenal, you would describe this as being a little bit enlarged with nodular contours. And really, that's all you will see in PPNH. So um, you need to be aware and quite alert when you're looking through the adrenals in these young patients. The, the massive adrenal place is quite different, actually, uh, as its name suggests, the adrenal glands look huge. Um, and yet these patients have very mild cortisol production, which isn't the case in case if we were looking at um, ectopic ACTH production, because the if you were faced with just this appearance, you'd have two differentials, of course. Uh, outside the metastatic reign. You would think about whether this was ectopic ACTH production, where the adrenals have a very high drive, get very large and very nodular, or you have um, massive adrenal hyperplasia. The difference is in with the ectopic ACTH production, it's overt Cushing's, the patient is very symptomatic. Whereas in these cases, they've got a little trickle of cortisol and they're not really very symptomatic. So that correlation between the biochemistry, the clinical picture and what the adrenals look like is, is extremely important. And that's really pretty much a theme for most of end, uh, endocrine disease. You can't really work at it on your own. You need the uh, endocrinologists to work with. So the challenge, of course, is are we dealing with massive adrenal hyperplasia or an ectopic ACTH? So virilization is the third part of our cortex. Um, this usually gets picked up much earlier in men than it gets picked up in women. Um, and the reason for that is that the androgenic effects are much more um, apparent in men earlier than they are in women, because women generally tend to present with uh, intramenstrual bleeding, so it takes a little while to go through the gynecological cycle to then start working out, ah, oh, they've got an androgen access, and then we look for causes of, with androgen access. And PCO, um, very common in the general public, however, um, can also mask the virilization coming from the adrenal gland. So the adrenal causes, again, much more frequent with adenomas than they are with carcinomas in adults. Uh, the pattern is again reversed in children. So if you've got a young child or you've got a young, very young woman coming in with profound virilization, then you really need to be looking for the carcinomas. So again, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, trickle of the androgens, again, they're not very symptomatic. Um, Again, the, the, the imaging features, I'm not going to dwell on them very much today because they are pretty much the same as the others. You're looking for an adenoma or a carcinoma. Much more varied in its presentation is medullary hyperfunction. And of, of medullary hyperfunction, the pheochromocytomas are the, are the most well-known tumor of the adrenal medulla. Um, and rarely you can also get medullary hyperplasia of the adrenal gland. Pheochromocytomas are the rule of tens, remember, 10% ten are, mul are multiple, 10% are malignant, 10% are associated with other syndromes, and 10% will be non-functioning. The role of imaging, again, in patients who are coming in with the known entity, either biochemically or with clinical pictures, is to find it. Um, remember the extra adrenal pheos. Uh, if you don't see them in the adrenal gland, then you've got to look elsewhere. We can plan the surgical resection, particularly with the surgeons. 
And the increasingly now, because we know of the gene mutations associated with pheochromocytomas, we tend to be using more imaging now in the screening setting for medullary dysfunction. The most common modalities we use are CT and MR, which are interchangeable, mainly ultrasound and MIBG in the children. And as FDG and gallium become more established in the patterns of medullary disease, I think we're now beginning to focus a lot more on gallium PET CT for the neuroendocrine tumors. They have an enormous range of appearance. Um, they range from looking very benign to looking very malignant, but the key is the elevated catecholamines. And in our workshop, um, we've got a large array of these tumours, which we can hopefully work through. So aside from the pheochromocytomas, the medulla also produces other neuroendocrine tumours. And this is a uh, sort of a summary range of these tumours. They range from being the very malignant from the neuroblastomas, which we generally generally tend to see in infants and children, to the very benign looking neuromas, which are incidental finding in adults. Most of them will produce other hormones in addition to the catecholamines. The more malignant they are, the more VMA and HVA they produce. And as they become more benign, they go down into the noradrenaline and the GI peptide range. Um, they will present with hypertension, palpitations, fever, and if they've got a lot of VIP on board or, v or VMA, then they will also have GI presentations. That was all about hyperfunction, when you're really looking for tumours and hyperplastic syndromes. Um, let's not forget that the adrenal gland can also have hypofunction. And in the Western Hemisphere, there are two main causes for that. One, is, the first one and the most important one is autoimmune disease. So the autoimmune disease effectively just slowly, gradually destroys the adrenal cortex, but also the adrenal medulla. And so all of the adrenal function begins to fall. More dramatic is hypovolemic states where both adrenal glands are infarcted very quickly. And we generally tend to see them in the Western Hemisphere in the post-surgical patients or patients who've had profound sepsis. And the cause for that is that they have internal hemorrhage within the adrenal gland and then the adrenal gland dies. So these are a very acute onset. You will see the, the lesions being bilateral. Um, whereas the autoimmune atrophy is much slower on, on, in onset. We're also increasingly beginning to see drugs that are causing this, and immunotherapy particularly, with the autoimmune disease that it causes and an adrenalitis that it causes, produces a subacute onset as well. Infections not so common in the Western world, but CMV and TB worldwide are also still very, very frequent causes of adrenal hypofunction. Now, um, I've got a few examples here just to show you um, uh, a autoimmune adrenal atrophy. I mean, the adrenal glands are extremely difficult to find in these patients. They're little hair-like slits because they've just completely um, atrophied altogether. Uh, this is a patient who presented with post-operative hemorrhage in both adrenal glands. This is the hemorrhage in the, on, on the left side. Of course, it involutes over time. And depending on the extent of the hemorrhage in the adrenal, you may become completely Addisonian as well. So this is CMV um, and in a patient with HIV and AIDS. You can still see the contour of the adrenal gland within this um, it, within the two glands, but all around the adrenal gland is edema. Um, this is a, a T2 heavily weighted sequence, so you can actually appreciate all of the edema that is around the adrenal capsule and the adrenal gland, but none of this will enhance. So if you have, if you gave them post-contrast images, you'll see the underlying adrenal, if it is still got vascularity, will enhance, but none of the edema enhances. So in conclusion, um, this is a whistle stop through the um, adrenal dysfunction, but functional adrenal disease will present mainly clinically and biochemically. And we're there with imaging to play a critical role in determining what's causing the underlying pathology and what the subsequent management will be. You do need to work with the endocrinologists and the biochemistry, otherwise um, it, it makes no sense. Um, it uh, do make sure that the, the imaging findings, because they can actually 
um, correlate and actually have gray areas with other uh, disease entities that you know what the biochemistry of the patient is. And it pretty much dictates what your eventual diagnosis is going to be. We generally use CT, which is the mainstay of our imaging. Ultrasound and MR are much more in children and selected patients where you can't use CT. MIBG is specific for medullary disease, but it's not very sensitive. And increasingly, we are using um, gallium PET and other novel traces to look for adrenal disease. Thank you. Now, I'm not going to open the floor for uh, questions at the moment. If we can keep the questions to the end of the sessions, then we can have a much more interactive conversation with all three speakers. Thank you. In this talk, we are going to talk about, uh, discuss the approach to cystic renal masses. My name is Atul Shingare. Uh, I'm from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. I have no relevant conflicts of interest. So our objectives from this talk are to see the approach to cystic mass evaluation, to understand the newer version, version 2019 of Bosnia classification, and to see some practical tips of use of Bosnia classification in routine clinical practice. Because it's a very vast topic, we are not going to discuss specific CT and MRI technique, ultrasound, or imaging features of uh, specific pathologies or rare entities. So what are the challenges when we evaluate renal masses? These are common and often benign, and yet they are often resected. Also, many of the treated RCCs are indolent, and that means we are over-treating these, leading to unnecessary cost and morbidity. We know that nephron loss is harmful. It leads to cardiovascular events and even death, and as radiologists, we can help avoid this overmanagement by reducing unnecessary imaging, by reducing unnecessary surgeries, and by promoting appropriate imaging and biopsies. So what's the objective when we assess these masses on imaging? One, I mean, most important is to determine management, because if they are benign, we should ignore them. If they're indeterminate, evaluate them. And if they're malignant, we manage them. And not necessarily using surgery, because the management could be active surveillance, it could be minimally invasive procedures such as ablation or partial or total nephrectomy. So how do you approach these masses? Let's see you see this. It's always about what's the next step. So would you do a renal mass protocol CT, MRI, refer this patient to urology or do something else? Now, if I told you, okay, you should do something else, what do you need? You need clinical information. Because the moment I tell you this patient presented with fever and chills, now suddenly you're going to think, hey, you know what? This is a renal abscess. So an important take home is every renal mass is not a neoplasm. Even if it's a neoplasm, it may not be malignant, especially small renal tumors. And even if it is RCC, it's not necessarily aggressive, so it may not need resection. So this is something very important that we should remember. So anytime you see a renal mass, that may include a neoplastic process, benign or malignant, or a non-neoplastic process. So as radiologists, that's our first question. Is this neoplastic lesion? Let's say it is. Then the next question is, is it solid or cystic, such as this lesion? So what do you think, solid or cystic? So for that, we need to understand the composition of renal mass. It's the internal makeup of the mass, and it's a solid mass if there is at least 25% solid enhancing components or fat. It's a cystic mass if there's less than 25% solid enhancing comp components. So this is a solid renal mass because clearly there is this peripheral rind of enhancing tumor. Another example, would you call this solid renal mass? Again, we see some cystic areas, but we also see this enhancing a very ill-defined uh, component. And if you scroll up and down, like in the actual masterclass, you can scroll through these cases up and then see it for yourself. But there was more than 25% solid enhancing component. And this was also a solid renal mass. But then these cystic areas can sometimes be confusing. So this is a pitfall. On imaging, we should try to differentiate between necrosis and cystic areas. If you see hypodensity without any sort of solid rind around it, if the margins are well-defined, usually it's a cystic lesion. But if you see this soft tissue, ill-defined margins, this could be necrosis. Now, we call it necrosis on imaging, but on pathology, it could be necrosis, fibrosis, or cystic change. So again, to see some examples, this is a solid mass. Clearly, there's solid component, irregular margins. This is a cystic mass, and this is another solid mass with necrotic areas. 
So that's our second question. Is the mass cystic or solid? Because if it's a cystic mass, we can apply Bosnia classification. Now, what do you think is a Bosnia class of this lesion? Now, we just saw that cystic mass means it cannot have more 25% or more of solid component. But here, there's a lot of solid enhancing areas. So this, again, is a necrotic mass. This is a solid mass. We cannot apply Bosnia classification. So what is this version 2019? Why do we need it? So in summary, it one, it's formally incorporates MRI. It has specific definitions for various imaging features and Bosnia classes. Hopefully, that will make it more objective. The intent is to improve the inter-reader agreement. It, it incorporates a larger variety of cystic renal masses. It includes even some of the incompletely characterized masses. That means it has greater applicability. It attempts to assign a lower Bosnia class. What, was, what would have been a Bosnia 3 legion before, some of them are pushed down to 2F by this classification. Hopefully, that will improve the specificity. And as an important reminder, this is not applicable to RCC syndromes. Now, there's a lot of text here, but I only want you to focus on that in, that in red. So if it's a Bosniak type one or two mass, no follow-up needed. 2F, follow-up at six months, 12 months, then annually up to five years. And three and four, urology consultation. So that's the basically outcome. When you see a mass, this is what you're going to recommend. Now, before we dive into it, let's understand some of the basic definitions. So we're gonna talk about wall and septa, and this will take, up, take you up to Bosniak type three. So if you see thin up to two millimeter thick wall, it's a Bosniak type one lesion. So anytime you see a cystic lesion, you want to measure these walls, it makes sense to adjust your window setting correctly, magnify the lesion, and then measure the wall so that you can measure it accurately. If you see this kind of thin wall, but now on top of that, we see a few thin, septa. So thin is up to two millimeter, few is less than three. That's a type two cyst. If you see minimally thick wall or septa, that's 2F. If you see many of these thin septa, so four or more of this thin septa, that's also 2F. And finally, if you see this kind of thick wall or septation, measuring four millimeter or more, that's Bosnian type three. Now this, for, for legions to be type two and type three, they must enhance. The other type of definition we need is solid component. This is important for type three and type four legions. If you see this kind of irregular thickening with obtuse angle measuring up to three millimeter in thickness, that's type three. If the thickness is more than four millimeter, again, enhancement, and you have thickness more than four millimeter, that's type four lesion. Or if you see a nodule with acute angles, then the size doesn't matter. They could be tiny, one millimeter, two millimeter, and even then you would call it Bosnia type four lesion. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into this. So type one, you'll notice all the cystic lesions have, are supposed to be well marginated. Why? To avoid that confusion with necrotic solid mass. Uh, type one cysts have fluid attenuation. There's no septation or calcification, thin, smooth wall, which may enhance which enhancement is defined by attenuation increase by 20 HU or more than 15% increase in signal. Now, this type 1 is applicable both to ultrasound and MRI. Type 2 lesion is, again, thin, smooth wall and few thin septa. Again, the walls and septa may enhance. There may be calcification, doesn't matter. And again, walls and septations may enhance. If you see this type of minimally thick up three millimeter septation or wall, or if you see many thin septa, that's Bosnian type two F cyst. Sometimes you may see on MRI, there may be heterogeneous T1 hyper intense non-enhancing lesion that you can also classify as type two F. Again, for lesion to be type two F, three or four, there must be enhancement. What's Bosnian type three lesion? If you see this kind of thick wall or septation, four millimeter or more, or if you see this kind of uh, irregular thickening measuring at least three millimeter in thickness and that enhances, then you can call this Bosnian type three lesion. And we already saw this type four lesion means four millimeter or thick with conv uh, convex protrusions, or if you see tiny nodules, on purpose I've given like these examples with very small nodules, but they all have acute angles. And if you saw that, 
you will characterize this as a type 4 lesion. So we saw, first look at renal mass, is it neoplastic, is it cystic? And then if you want to sort of go through an algorithm, it makes sense to start at the top or start with the type 4 lesion. If you see a nodule, it's type 4 lesion. If there's no nodule, but you see thickening of the wall or thickened wall or septa or irregular thickening measuring up to three millimeter, that's Bosnic type three. If that is also absent, see if there's any minimally thickened septations. If that's the case, it's type 2F. If that's absent, then look at the number of septations. If you have many thin septa, that's type 2F. If there are a few of them, up to three septations, thin, regular, it's type 2 cyst. And if there's no septation, no calcification, that's Bosnian type 1 lesion. So that's the algorithm I tend to follow. So if you want to put that as, take an example, what's the Bosnian class of this mass? So if you start with our checklist or an algorithm, is there a nodule? I'm only showing you one image here. You can't scroll up and down, but trust me on this. There was no nodule. Was there an, is there any thick wall or septation or irregular thickening? No. Is there minimally thickened wall or septation? No. What about number of septations? So clearly there are four or more septa. So that's Bosniac type 2F cyst. Also, there are some special scenarios for Bosniac type 2 cysts. We already saw this, thin, few septations. But what if you're looking at unenhanced CT and you see a homogeneous hyperattenuating lesion, hyperdense cyst? Or if you see homogeneous lesion, that's less than 20 HU on unenhanced CT. Now remember these words, homogeneous is really important. And I'm going to talk about why. If you're looking at a single phase, portal venous phase, that's our bread and butter. That's where we see most of these lesions. If you see homogeneous mass, but that measures, let's say, 25 HU, that's also type 2 cyst. On renal mass protocol, if you see homogeneous non-enhancing mass, but that's more than 20 HU, or if you see a tiny lesion that's too small to characterize, all these can be called Bosniac type 2 cysts. Now, why am I harping on that homogeneous? This lesion, if you put one big ROI, it's 15 HU. Can you dismiss this as a cyst or Bosnian type 1 lesion or type 2 lesion? No, you can't. One, there's no contrast, so type, it's not type 1. Even on unenhanced CT, just because attenuation is less than 20, you can't assume that's type 2 lesion because homogeneity. If you put smaller ROIs on this, you can see attenuation of 24, 17, 33. So it's a heterogeneous lesion. In this case, you should get contrast enhanced CT, which shows there is enhancing component. This is actually a solid necrotic mass. This was an aggressive, actually, clear cell RCC. Another example, clearly, even looking at this, you know it's not a homogeneous lesion. If you make the mistake of putting one big R region of interest, you'll get like 19 HU. But if you put two smaller region of interest, you see 28 and 16 HU. This is a heterogeneous lesion. It's a solid mass. This was an oncocytoma. So be wary of heterogeneous masses on unenhanced CT. On MRI, there are a few special cases. We already saw this, thin, few septations. But on contrast, a non-contrast MRI, if you see homogeneous markedly T2 hyperintense lesion, or if you see markedly T1 hyperintense lesion, you can still assume these are type 2 cysts. Some special scenarios, if on CT, if you see abundant calcification, or if you see heterogeneous non-enhancing lesions, or it looks like hyperdense cyst, but it's pretty large, three more than three centimeter, get an MRI because on CT, you may be missing something. So in summary, renal masses are often overtreated. Radiologists have a role in optimizing the management. It's important to exclude non-neoplastic causes of renal mass. Bosnac 2019 is the current version that we should use. Cystic masses have less than 25% solid components. Do not confuse solid necrotic lesions with cystic mass. And beware of heterogeneity in low attenuation mass on unenhanced CT. When it comes to Bosnia classification, remember these definitions. Thin wall or septation is up to 2 millimeter. Minimally thick, 3 millimeter. Or thick is 4 millimeter or more. Number of septations few is up to 3. Many is 4 or more. And if you see this irregular thickening, it's type 3 cyst. If you see a nodule or thickening more than 4 millimeter, 4 millimeter or more, that's Bosniac type 4 lesion. Thank you. Now I'll pass this on to Harsh. Great. Uh, 
I guess my talk will follow some of the same uh, concepts and ideas that Atul talked about. Uh, so uh, my name is Hirsch Rana. I'm from uh, NYU in uh, New York City, and I'm going to talk about approaching solid renal masses. Uh, these are my disclosures, but not are, not are relevant to the current topic. Uh, again, what I'll try to do with the next 17 or 18 minutes is talk about role of radiologists and imaging of solid renal masses. And it's driven by whatever urologists expect from us in the context of what they used to expect from us to say, is this a cancer or not a cancer? Current expectation, they're talking about not only diagnosing cancer, but actually guiding them with appropriate therapy. And future trend is obviously towards individualized and personalized medicine and how we can contribute to that. Um, just say very similar to what Atul talked about, I think we overtreat renal cancers and it's partly because we overdiagnose them. Incidence of kidney cancer has been steadily rising. Uh, and, the, and these renal masses are usually diagnosed on imaging for unrelated condition. For example, patient goes to the emergency room with a uh, abdominal pain, gets a CT to evaluate for appendicitis. Um, there's no appendicitis, but you detect a one centimeter or two centimeter solid renal mass in the kidney. So most of these are diagnosed incidentally. And again, there's a stage migration. We are diagnosing these patients asymptomatically and also with small lesions. So small renal cancer represent about 70% of all renal cancer detected now. And most of these do not metastasize or cause death. However, when you can't discriminate between a tumor that is aggressive from not aggressive tumor, they're all kind of considered a, a they're treated. Uh, historically, they were all treated with surgery. Uh, and as a tool mentioned, there are other options now being considered from watchful waiting to uh, less inv invasive treatment options. However, to keep in mind that to, the real paradigm shift here is that we want to treat aggressive tumor with the most aggressive therapy like surgery. But those that are indolent or less aggressive tumor, we want to be able to identify them so that we can treat them with a less aggressive measures. Such a paradigm requires a imaging or non-invasive methods to accurately differentiate tumors of different aggressiveness. And I think that is where the shift has been happening in how we contribute to personalized imaging. So looking at it historically, historically we want to first our decision to decide uh, as Atul mentioned, is the solid mass or not? If the solid mass, our uh, goal is to decide if it's a benign solid mass or it's a cancer. Uh, the teaching has always been that almost not all non-bulk fat containing enhancing le lesions are deemed malignant and has a surgical or at least requiring treatment. So historically, our goal has been to detect presence or absence of enhancement and presence or absence of macroscopic fat. Uh, the tools that we have on our hand is ultrasound, CT, and MRI. That's what I'll briefly talk about. Uh, and given the time constraint, I'll just show a few slides and one or two cases of each. So advantage of ultrasound is obviously it's low cost, no radiation or contrast, very easy to use, and it's great for initial screening of solid versus cystic lesion. The disadvantage is that it has lower sensitivity for small lesions. It's user dependent. Uh, and, and it has some challenges with lesion characterization. So this is a solid renal mass in the right kidney. There's an echogenic lesion. And the question is, is it echogenic enough that we can be confident that it contains bulk fat and hence it's a benign lesion such as the angiomyolipoma or is the echogenicity not sufficient to diagnose this as benign containing bulk fat? Uh, when we look at a T1 weighted pre-contrast image, we said this is a T1 hyperintense lesion that does not contain bulk fat. And this was a oncocytic tumor with enhancement on subtraction images. So this was a non-bulk fat containing solid enhancing lesion and hence would have been deemed surgical. A CT is the most widely used imaging modality. Uh, it's been the most, most validated in evaluation of renal lesions. It provides isotropic resolution with a really short scanning time. Uh, the disadvantages, obviously, as you all know, is that it requires uh, use of identity contrast and requires radiation dose. And it has some limitations that we'll briefly talk about as well. Uh, the key here is to make sure that we perform right protocol when we're trying to characterize renal masses. So if the goal is to characterize renal masses, we should perform imaging prior to contrast administration and, in a, and after contrast administration and nephrographic phase of enhancement. The pre-contrast imaging per, uh, serves two purposes. You're looking for presence of bulk fat, uh, presence or absence of bulk fat, and then we want to look for enhancement. So if there's a change in uh, greater than 20 hands per unit between pre and post-contrast imaging, and as uh, to mention, you put multiple ROIs, a region of interest, 
uh, if there's greater than 20 Hz for the difference from pre to post contrast, that's true enhancement. Less than 10 Hz for unit is no enhancement. Between 10 and 20 Hz for unit, uh, it's uh, indeterminate or intermediate enhancement. And they may require further evaluation because you have to differentiate between non enhancing lesions from lesions that have low level of enhancement. Let's look at an example here. So this is a, a lesion in the right kidney. This is a small lesion that uh, on a pre-contrast images, there is no bulk fat. There's nothing here that measures uh, uh, less than zero attenuation on uh, when you put ROI. On a post-contrast image, there's a change in attenuation from uh, greater than 20 household units. So this is a solid renal enhancing mass on CT. Let's look at briefly some limitations of CT that includes uh, characterization of small lesions, calcified lesions, as I think Atul mentioned that also, and also differentiating low level enhancement from non-enhancing lesions. And the reason why that's important is that papillary subtype of kidney cancers tend to have low level enhancement. So these are small lesions and uh, there are two lesions in the kidney. One is anterior lesion and a posterior lesion. They both are too small to characterize on CT. Uh, on a subtraction MRI, um, Again, I'm only showing you one slice, but the anterior lesion had no enhancement and the posterior lesion had low level enhancement. Over time, this posterior lesion grew and was a papillary subtype of kidney cancer on a biopsy. Again, I can't stress uh, enough about putting region of interest and looking at homogeneous versus heterogeneous lesion. This is a lesion that had a attenuation between 20 and 25 hands filled in it on a post-contrast image. Uh, question is, is this a cystic lesion? Is it a solid lesion? Uh, and on MRI, we see that this is actually a SOD lesion that has some T1 hyperintensity on a pre-contrast image and has some areas of enhancement. Uh, so again, if you put a region of interest in a small region of interest, you'll find that the anteriorly was more heterogeneous and the posterior was much more lower attenuation. So again, we want to be very careful about deciding if it's a solid lesion or a cystic lesion, and if CT is unclear, the MRI adds value. A calcified lesion, uh, as Atul mentioned, Again, hard to know uh, if there's any enhancement here or not. And I love this case because this is one of the uh, first few examples, early MRI in our practice with Dr. Bosniak and Gary Israel, uh, showing that actually MRI adds value for assessment of enhancement with subtraction images. Again, this MRI is from 20, 2003 and 2004. MRI quality has got significantly better, but the idea here is that when you have a calcified lesion and we're not sure of enhancement, MRI with subtraction imaging could be quite helpful. So looking at MRI protocol, uh, our protocol consists of in and out of phase or chemical shift imaging to look for microscopic and macroscopic fat. We do some T2-weighted imaging, diffusion weighted imaging, and we perform dynamic T1 pre and post contrast imaging at multiple time points after contrast injection. Again, as we don't have a concern for radiation, our protocol includes imaging both on cortical medullary, nephrographic, and urographic phases of enhancement. So we're getting a multi-phase uh, post-contrast imaging with MRI. So let's look at what we're interested in doing. We're, we're interested in looking for enhancement and for fat. So we have a lesion in the left kidney here that on a T1 fat side non-contrast images has a low a signal and on a post-contrast images has a high signal. So this is a... Uh, you know, enhancing lesion in the left kidney, uh, and it's pretty easy to make diagnosis on a visual inspection or qualitative evaluation. What about this lesion here? Again, this is a cystic lesion with a nodule, but the nodule is T1 hyper intense. So this is a T1 weighted uh, pre-contrast image, and this is a T1 weighted post-contrast image. And the question is, is this lesion enhancing? Because it already has T1 hyper intensity, visual inspection may not be sufficient in assessment for enhancement. And in this case, there are a couple of options. We put a region of interest over the pre and post contrast images and look for change in signal intensity. It's very important to keep in mind that you have the same acquisition parameters for pre and post contrast images. And it's because in MRI, as you know, the signal intensity depends on your acquisition parameters. So if you change acquisition parameters between pre and post contrast images, we will not be sure if the change in signal is because of enhancement or because of our acquisition parameters. So what we do in our practice is we just copy the pre-contrast images and, 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 and do it also post-contrast with the exactly same imaging parameters. Other way to look for enhancement is to actually do subtraction imaging where we do voxel-wise subtraction of pre-contrast images from post-contrast images. Almost all scanners now do this automatically at the scanner and generate subtraction images. Let's show you here. So this is a pre-contrast image as I showed you before, post-contrast image, 
and this is a subtraction image. And on subtraction image, anything that has a higher signal intensity is, has to be because of presence of gallium contrast. And this is a enhancing nodule in a cystic right renal lesion. Other goal that we have is to assess for fat. And here we want to do frequency selective fat suppression, either on T1 or T2 in images to look for bulk fat. We can also use in and out of phase imaging, but to keep in mind that when we see a signal loss on out of phase acquisition, that is consistent with intravoxel fat and not bulk fat. And that's not sufficient to diagnose a lesion as having as being angiomyolipoma or benign lesion. Let me show you a few examples. This is a T1 weighted in phase image, and this is a T1 weighted out of phase image. And we have this lesion in the right kidney that has high signal intensity. Uh, on an out of phase image, that lesion still has high signal intensity. But if you look around that lesion, you see what we call this India ink artifact. So a voxel that contains both fat and water loses signal on out of phase image. The kidney has water in it, so this lesion must contain fat for it to have India ink artifact. Let's look at this other lesion here. Uh, this lesion also has India ink artifact. What it means is that this lesion must contain bulk fat for a voxel to contain both fat and water. And you can confirm this with a frequency selective fat saturation where we suppress signal from all the bulk fat. So bulk fat in the visceral and subcutaneous fat loses signal and the bulk fat in this lesion loses signal. This is a fat, bulk fat containing lesion and hence an angiomyolipoma. What about this lesion here? This is an in-phase image, out-of-phase image. We have a signal loss in out-of-phase image consistent with intravoxel fat. However, there is no India ink artifact here. So there is, we haven't proved that this lesion contains bulk fat. And hence, we cannot make a diagnosis of angiomyolipoma based on this in and out of phase images. We've got to look at other sequences and other contrast. On a T2 weighted images, this is a very heterogeneous lesion. Uh, it's hyper intense and has heterogeneous enhancement. And this is actually a clear cell renal cell cancer and not an angiomyolipoma. So both angiomyolipoma and, and renal cancers can demonstrate loss of signal on out of phase images. However, with a look at T2 signal intensity, if there is a heterogeneous T2 signal, that's more likely to be a renal cancer. If it's a homogeneously iso-intense or hypo-intense, it's likely to be an angiomyolipoma. Um, hemorrhage and heterogeneous enhancement is also more common in kidney cancer, like renal cell cancer. Uh, diffusion imaging might help. Uh, studies have shown that angiomyolipoma tend to have a lower ADC compared to other subtypes of kidney cancer. Another type of kidney cancer in a benign lesion is oncocytoma and chromophobe renal cell cancer. Oncocytoma is a benign lesion and chromophobe uh, renal cell cancer is a kidney cancer. They both tend to have overlapping imaging features. One of this is oncocytoma, one of them is a chromophobe. To be honest, I can't remember which one is which at this point because they both have similar features. And hence, these kind of cases tend to go to either biopsy or surgery, because even at biopsy, it's sometimes difficult to differentiate between these two entities. Another thing to keep in mind when we're evaluating this lesion is to discriminate between a central renal cell cancer from a urothelial neoplasm. And, the, and it's important because from uh, management options. If it's a renal cell cancer, it could be treated with a partial nephrectomy or total nephrectomy. But if it's a urothelial tumor, it's treated with a, a urethral nephrectomy. So you not only remove the, the tumor, but you also remove the ureter on that side. And so this is actually a centrally located urothelial tumor that if we did not suggest that diagnosis, our surgeons might just do a nephrectomy and it would be an incomplete treatment. So again, there are a couple of features that help us differentiate between a urothelial tumor and renal cell cancer. We look for homogeneous enhancement is more common in urothelial tumor. They also have a homogeneous low signal on T2 weighted images. They are hypovascular and they usually do not have cystic and necrotic areas. And if they're arising from the collecting system, then obviously we can suggest a diagnosis of urothelial tumor. Our job is not only to diagnose these uh, solid renal lesions, suggest a diagnosis of renal cancer, but also stage them. Obviously, I won't go into a lot of detail here, um, but uh, we provide appropriate staging and MRI or CT is useful to look for uh, renal vein invasion uh, uh, and as well as uh, adenopathy and distant metastases. So that is in the context of historical uh, expectations from radiologists. Uh, that's what we talked about. However, urologists don't not only expect us to diagnose these tu tumors, but also provide them with preoperative planning or help them with surgical approach. So there are a couple of options for treating these tumors. You can consider 
total nephrectomy versus partial nephrectomy is a tool mentioned. The goal really is to preserve as much as kidney parenchyma as possible. So if it's possible, our surgeons would prefer to do partial nephrectomy. There are a couple of approaches for doing partial nephrectomy. You can do it as an open surgery that allows you to cool the kidney and decrease hypoxic injury to the kidney, but it's more invasive uh, compared to laparoscopic approach, which is less invasive, but you can't cool the kidney. So you have to clamp the vessels while you operate and that causes perfusion reperfusion injury. So whatever you just would like to know is how difficult or complex a surgery will be. And the way we provide that information is through this so-called nephrometry score, where we look at the tumor size, are they located uh, exophytic or endophytically, uh, how close they are to the collecting system, and so on. And higher the score means more complex the lesion. And our surgeons use this to decide if they're going to operate them with a partial nephrectomy with laparoscopically or with open surgery. For example, these both are T1, uh, T1A disease, less than four centimeter tumor. This is an exophytic tumor, which is pretty easy to operate. Uh, this will be a partial nephrectomy laparoscopically. This is a centrally located tumor, and this tumor is actually invading the vessels uh, and, and renal pelvis. So although it's a small tumor, this will be treated with a nephrectomy. Uh, so just to very briefly to, to end, uh, what should our report include? Uh, when, uh, Society of Down Radiology did a, um, a, a, a survey of both urologists and radiologists, and what they found is that we all agree that our, our report should include the mass size, mass type, is it cystic or solid? Is there a fat or no fat? Is there enhancement or no enhancement? And radiologic stage. However, uh, our urologists also want more information from us. They want nephrometry score. They want to know where the mass is located compared to renal polar line because that drives their approach. It's going to be anterior, anterior approach or posterior approach for, for treatment. And they also want degree of enhancement. And you might say, why that's the case? Well, again, this goes to the fact that there are two types of kidney cancer that are most common. Clear cell renal cancer is the most common kidney cancer that has a very uh, avid enhancement and it's more aggressive. The papillary subtype of kidney cancer tend to be uh, less avidly enhancing or they're hypo-enhancing and they're less aggressive. So a urologist would like to know that because if it's a, a less aggressive tumor, they may, in some cases where it's not a great surgical case, they might prefer to do other less invasive approaches. So I think we're going towards from our current expectation to what our future expectation is, which is to guide personalized therapy. So in conclusion, our, our role is to diagnose and stage renal cell cancer, provide preoperative planning, but, uh, uh, and we'll talk to more about this uh, hands-on workshop, is to also provide non-invasive assessment of tumor aggressiveness that will allow uh, individualized therapy. So, and I know it's a whirlwind tour of uh, uh, how we approach these tumors, but uh, I hope you got a really good insight, at least as a framework, for approaching these tumors. And I'm happy to take any questions with my panelists, uh, Atula and uh, Anju. Well, thank you. Um, if I if I can just start, I, there have been a couple of questions on the chat and QA. Um, the first one was really about, from, from my perspective, I, there was a question on um, signal loss. Uh, and the question was, uh, in and out of chemical shift sequence with micro microscopic fat is considered likewise a fat rich adenoma even if t1 fats adds it so my understanding from that question is that you were trying to ask um the difference between the in and out of phase and the fat sats and i think um, harsh has also touched on exactly the same thing in the last bit of the talk so it, it just like the renal uh, lesions for the adrenal lesions uh, if you're going to see chemical shift loss then that implies that the lesion has is an admixture of fat um, and fluid. So if you have a lesion with just fat or a lesion with just fluid, they're not going to lose signal intensity on the outer phase images. You need a combination of those two together to see signal loss on uh, outer phase images. Conversely, however, if you have got a uh, area of true fat within an adrenal lesion, then that is a myelolipoma because adenomas do not have macroscopic or true fat within them. They have a high intracellular component, which is what gives it the uh, lipid 
uh, behavior on the in, on the outer phase, but they do not have macroscopic fat. That would be an AML. And the AMLs will lose signal on the fat saturated sequences, and they will have macroscopic fat on CT. Adenomas will not. So to be able to distinguish those two, um, you do need to look at the inner outer phase and the fat saturated sequences on MR, but you can work it out. I'm happy to open it. If anybody would just uh, like to verbalize a question as well, that would be fine. I guess another, other question was uh, maybe a tool of you uh, was about use of contrast and has ultrasound yeah, for sure. you have Bosniac lesions. Right. So uh, as of now, ultrasound or contrast and central sound is not part of Bosnia classification. So we do use contrast and central sound and we do find it very helpful for evaluation of renal masses, especially to determine if it's a solid mass, if there is vascularity within. But let's say you injected contrast, and I mean, let's say you injected ultrasound contrast and you saw septations. We don't know how that definition would translate to the current Bosniak definitions on what we see on CT and MRI. And that's why we cannot apply Bosniak classification on ultrasound yet, unless it's a type one cyst. Then you can say, even on ultrasound, you can say it's most likely Bosniak type one. There is a group of people, um, part of the SAR, RCC, DFP, who are working on, working to see if we can incorporate ultrasound into Bosnia classification, but that work is still in progress. And, and there's another question about Bosnia classification. So I'm just going to address it very quickly. It's a great question. Uh, the question is, there's only one millimeter difference between three and four millimeter or, or at a slice, either septation thickness or wall thickness. And that one millimeter can drive you from a Bosnia two to two F to a three. Uh, you know, isn't, and, but could that one millimeter be just an error of measurements? I think it's a fantastic question. And I think I, I would start by saying one of the reason why, you know, some of us feel confident uh, as downstaging this lesion is that most of the studies have shown that these cystic, truly cystic renal cell cancer, not the necrotic ones that Atul showed, or not the one that have a big solid component, but if there's cystic lesions, uh, they tend to be really indolent. So there's a study that our group has done and many of us have done where they've shown that they tend never to metastasize or cause death if they're truly Bosniak 2Fs and 3s. So yes, it, those small measurements can drive you from a 2F, from 2 to 2F or 2F to 3. But in a context, we tend to overtreat these lesions. So I did that again, you know, you can downplay some of these lesions. And if you end up calling them, you know, 2F or even 3s, I don't, I'm not 100% sure they need to be operated on. So a lot of these classifications are based on area under the curve. So yes, three or four millimeters are cut off, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't have a three millimeter that's really maybe pre-neoplastic and, and a four millimeter that's a benign lesion. So yes, there's always going to be some overlap. Yeah, that's a great, actually, I, I was looking at the answered question and missed this, but yeah, Harsh, I completely agree with that. And one millimeter, so one, one of the things we do is magnify the lesion so to improve the accuracy. But again, getting to the core of this question, just one millimeter won't make a difference. So it's perfectly fine to downstage those. That's the whole point behind the new Bosnia classification. We want to pull down from Bosnia type 3 to 2F, some other 2Fs to type 2, uh, to reduce this unnecessary surgeries and interventions. It's just one um, proviso I was going to put on this is, is um, I don't think we can strictly apply the kind of relaxed attitude um, to the cystic lesions in the context of VHL and other genomic syndromes. So I think we do need to just exclude that. Um, so these are just your bog standard average person coming through the door. This is great. But if you're screening for cancer related pathologies, then that, then you've got to be a little bit more careful. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Bosnia classification yeah, does not apply to syndromes and yeah. free cancers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, one other question. Uh, any UK centres taking NHS referrals for metomidate bed? Um, I know of Cambridge uh, that currently does both um, NHS research work and metomidate. The problem with carbon-11 is that you need to have a cyclotron on site. So transferring carbon-11 around the country is quite challenging. Um, and, um, but equally, people are now beginning to work on a fluorine metomidate so that that would start to become a little bit more useful in NHS, uh, in sort of across the country practice. But Cambridge is presently taking both NHS and um, research work.
I had a question actually um, for Atul. Um, non, you showed us the pitfalls of non-contrast CT for use in trying to characterize uh, the adrenal uh, the renal lesions. Is there a place to say that actually we shouldn't be looking at non-contrast scans unless you've got a very well-defined lesion that you can you can write off? Yeah, I mean we. Whenever possible, we usually do prefer giving contrast, especially if you're evaluating a renal lesion, we definitely prefer a contrast and as CT. But sometimes we see them on a CT that is done without contrast. Or some yeah, so CT KUBs for me, right. there's tons of them. Yeah. Right. And what do you do when you see an incidental lesion on CT that's been performed without contrast? And that's where this is helpful because previously, all of them would be, uh, we would ask, okay, get contrast and as CT, get renal mass protocol CT or MR. We don't need to do that in many of these lesions. One, they are likely to be, well, most of them are indolent. And if you're sure, like you mentioned, if it's well-defined, if it's homogeneous, if the attenuation is less than 20, then we can dismiss them as cysts. So that's the reason. So it's, we can't exclude non-con CT, although that's not the preferred way to evaluate renal cysts. Okay. Um, and one question for Hirsch, actually. The renal scoring that you said uh, that we, we use, there, there are loads of scoring systems now um, popping up in the literature. So we've got the renal ones, we've got Padua, and now we've got the modified Padua and the spare. Um, anything that is better in one scoring system than the other? Uh, is there a preference? So I think it's a good question. I, th I think the reality, some of this is driven by your referring clinician's uh, interest and, and and desire because they are using it to make management decisions. So our urologists prefer nephrometry scoring system it, uh, for two reasons. First, actually, is that it's relatively simple. And so sometimes when, you know, it doesn't look at signal intensities, it does not look at ratios, it basically looks at the size and, and the location of the tumor. And it helps them guide, you know, a surgical approach. So they use it for two reasons. They use it to say, how complex is this surgery? Am I going to have to do a nephrectomy versus partial nephrectomy? And if I do partial nephrectomy, how long would I have to clamp the vessel? If it's going to take me a long time to operate, then I'm going to get a lot of perfusion, reperfusion injury. And if it's going to be hypoxic time, it's going to be say more than 20 or 30 minutes. I don't want to do that and injure that kidney. So I'm going to do an open uh, surgery. Uh, and then also it provides them as how they're going to approach it. Are they going to go from a side anteriorly or are they going to go from a, fl in a flank posteriorly? Because it tells them where to go to address the tumor. So one of the reasons why our nephrologists, uh, our urologists like that, it does not give them information about how aggressive the tumor is. So there's some of the scoring systems actually to tell you, is it more likely to be a clear cell? Is it more likely to be a papillary? Is it more likely to be aggressive? Uh, I think so. I think this will keep on evolving as our management options change. But I think talking to urologists and understanding what they want is probably better than just saying, use one uh, method versus the other scoring system. I have one more question um, on the chat. Um, thanks, Sid. Uh, what's what's the approach to heterogeneous adrenal lesions, uh, such as collision tumors, adenomas, and, uh, um, and other histology? So um, the most important thing for me is knowing the patient's presentation. Um, I've only talked about tumors today and sort of briefly mentioned other other pathologies, but the adrenal gland is susceptible to all kinds of diseases. So how the patient is presenting is absolutely key um, and what's their biochemistry. So if I'm dealing with, for example, um, a heterogeneous lesion where I think there is a component of an adenoma, but I can also see a lot of fat in the lesion around it. So is this a collision between a myelolipoma and an adenoma? Um, not both conditions are benign. So in terms of surgical management, that's not so crucial. But if they had functional activity, then the, the lesion contains an adenoma, whether it be a, a heterogeneous adenoma with fat or it is a collision tumor. Um, the other collision tumors that we're seeing more frequently now are uh, small carcinomas and again with myelolipomas, but again, it's function. Um, myelolipomas should not have any functions. They are effectively a combination of fat and myeloid uh, tissue. So there is no cortical uh, functioning tissue within that. Um, if your lesion has any kind of biochemical function, then you've got to revisit what you're calling a myelolipoma. Um, it may be a collision with something else, or it may be a something else with fat. 
So I think absolutely crucial is how they're presenting and what's their biochemistry. Anju, there's one more question for you. Oh, okay. It's like follow up for adrenal lesions that are less than 10 millimeter. Um, okay, uh, that's a really difficult question. Um, actually, um, all the guidelines uh, are work with lesions that are above a centimeter. Um, and the reason, and there are two reasons for that. One is it's very difficult to be sure about lesions that are under a centimeter. Um, is it really a lesion or is it a contour of the gland? Uh, is it actually a vessel coming into the adrenal? Um, the finer imaging that I do these days, I do sort of submillimeter uh, scans of the of the adrenal. And increasingly, you start to see all kinds of veins coming in, all kinds of arteries coming in, all of the things that we never used to see before. So the certainty of a lesion being real under a centimeter becomes more and more difficult. That is in a context where a patient is non-functioning. If the patient definitely has a secretory tumor, so they've got a cons, you know biochemically there is a cons, you're much more alert to the little ones because the, the cons adenomas will be little. Um, and in that context, follow-up doesn't really apply because they are going to be surgical candidates. Personally, I've never followed up a lesion that is a less than a centimeter. Um, this might come back and bite me in about five years, but um, at the moment, uh, don't follow up lesions that are under a centimeter because it's very difficult to be sure there are lesions at all. And you'll be doing a lot of follow up. Typical adenoma larger than four centimeters, follow up or resect. OK, so the new um, adrenal guidelines that are just currently being updated has actually removed the size criteria altogether. Um, what they want to do up front is to get your level of suspicion at presentation. So if you have got a lesion that you cannot dismiss as being benign, irrespective of its size, you need to consider surgery up front. If for some reason the patient declines surgery or they're unfit for surgery, then you would think about a follow up. And there, there has been a, a sort of a very, very detailed conversation about what's the time frame you use. And I think we went with the approach that if the patient was unsuitable for surgery at presentation, uh, then they are unlikely to become more suitable over time. And all you need to determine is whether you genuinely think this is a, a malignant lesion, and then they will be open to chemotherapy or biopsy or, or uh, revisit resection if they become fit. So the time frame we chose was no less than three months. So you'd follow them up at first, uh, at first follow up three months. Um, that gives you the window of further, further treatment if they remain within surgical uh, window but equally also gives you time to be certain that the lesion is definitely growing. So if it is a lesion that is growing by more than 20%, then by resist criteria, that is a, a progressive lesion. Anything less than that uh, becomes really difficult uh, in terms of conversations. And all of these conversations is the one thing that the guidelines stress very heavily is that these lesions are not simple and they must be managed within MDTs. So you've got to have a surgeon on board. You've got to have the endocrinologist there. Um, it, they're difficult decisions to make. So do you then follow up this lesion at all, particularly if the patient appears never to become suitable for surgical management, what exactly are you following them up for? Uh, and if they're non-functioning again, what are you following them up for? So all of that has to be in clinical context. So if it's larger than four centimetres um, at presentation, you need to put it up for, for surgical resection, even if it appears benign. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Yep, thank you very much. Thank and don't forget all the other webinars and the workshops coming up, particularly the masterclass for renal and adrenal imaging. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.